Human beings have natural unalienable rights which are incapable of being erased or obscured by any act of man or government. Jefferson said it most succinctly, quote, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, end quote. We could end this discussion right there. The, quote, appropriate role and purpose of government, end quote, is the, quote, security, the protection of unalienable rights, end quote. But we all know there is more to the story. Americans today are losing touch with the concept of God-given unalienable rights. Some, in fact, firmly reject the idea, even the existence of such rights, believing instead that government is not only the protector of our rights, but also their source. America's founders rejected this concept out of hand. As Jefferson clearly stated, we, quote, are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, end quote. He made a similar observation two years prior in his Summary View of the Rights of British America, and later in his 1785 Notes on the State of Virginia. Today, however, when someone speaks of, quote, natural law, end quote, or natural rights, they should be asked to clarify whether they are referring to God-given natural rights or rights which accrue to humans naturally through a social contract or the nature of things. The use of the adjective inherent in describing rights, as George Mason did in the 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights, lends itself to two different interpretations. The rights are either uniquely inherent to humans as creations of God, or are uniquely inherent to humans as the apex species of evolution. Given this, I prefer unalienable to inherent. Though a Christian, he authored The Truth of the Christian Religion. The Dutch political philosopher Hugo Gratius promoted the idea, borrowed from Cicero and others, that natural law was created by the natural order and was not, or at least not necessarily, a creation of God. Natural law did not require God's revelation, but could be discovered simply and solely through human reason. While America's founders knew of and respected Gratius, particularly his famous 1625 on the law of war and peace, they held to a theistic source of both natural law and natural rights. But even America's leaders had to remind their fellow citizens of this from time to time. Writing in reply to an essay from The Farmer, Alexander Hamilton explained, quote, the fundamental source of all your errors, sophisms, and false reasonings is a total ignorance of the natural rights of mankind. Were you once to become acquainted with these, you could never entertain a thought that all men are not by nature entitled to a parity of privileges. You would be convinced that natural liberty is a gift of the beneficent creator to the whole human race, and that civil liberty is founded in that and cannot be wrested from any people without the most magnificent violation of justice. Civil liberty is only natural liberty modified and secured by the sanctions of civil society. It is not a thing in its own nature, precarious and dependent on human will and caprice, but it is conformable to the constitution of man as well as necessary to the well-being of society. To grant that there is a supreme intelligence who rules the world and has established laws to regulate the actions of his creatures, and still to assert that man in a state of nature may be considered as perfectly free from all restraints of law and government appears to a common understanding altogether irreconcilable. God and wise men in all ages have embraced a very dissimilar theory. They have supposed that the deity, from the relations we stand into himself and to each other, has constituted an eternal and immutable law, which is indispensably obligatory upon all mankind, prior to any human institution whatever. This is what is called the law of nature. Upon this law depend the natural rights of mankind. The supreme being gave existence to man together with the means of preserving and beatifying that existence. He endowed him with rational faculties, by the help of which to discern and pursue such things 
as were consistent with his duty and interest and invested him with an inviolable right to personal liberty and personal safety. The sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. Human beings have natural unalienable rights which are incapable of being, quote, erased or obscured, end quote, by any act of man or government. In his 1765 dissertation on the canon and feudal law, John Adams insisted that our rights were, quote, derived from the great legislature of the universe, end quote. Virginia lawyer George Mason, arguing in the 1772 case of Robin versus Hardaway, 1 Jefferson 109, affirmed that, quote, the laws of nature are the laws of God. A legislature must not obstruct our obedience to him from whose punishments they cannot protect us. All human constitutions which contradict his laws, we are in conscience bound to disobey. Such have been the adjudications of our courts of justice, end quote. Our American founders, such as John Dickinson, expressed similar views, quote, Kings or parliaments could not give the rights essential to happiness. We claim them from a higher source, from the King of Kings and the Lord of all the earth. They are not annexed to us by parchments and seals. They are created in us by the decree of providence, which established the laws of our nature. They are born with us, exist with us and cannot be taken from us by any human power without taking our lives. In short, they are founded on the immutable maxims of reason and justice." End quote. Dickinson was an intriguing man largely overlooked today. Born into a family with long-standing ties to the Quaker religion, Dickinson received an education in the law at the Middle Temple, London, before setting up his practice near Philadelphia. He inherited land holdings in both Pennsylvania and Delaware and became one of the richest men in both states. In 1776, Dickinson represented Pennsylvania at the Continental Congress as it considered independence. His Quaker roots kept him from openly voting for independence and inevitable war. So on that fateful day of July 2nd, 1776, Dickinson, along with Robert Morris, absented himself to give the Pennsylvania delegation a majority in favor of Virginia's resolution for independence. Once the resolution for independence passed, Dickinson similarly refused to vote in favor of Jefferson's declaration, a decision which then forced his resignation from the Pennsylvania delegation. Once out of Congress, Dickinson surprisingly joined the Pennsylvania militia as a brigadier general becoming one of only two members of the First Continental Congress who actively took up arms during the war. Dickinson capped his long public service career by representing Delaware at the Constitutional Convention. In this statement on natural rights, Dickinson repeats familiar themes, rights originating with a creator God, resulting from God's natural law, and which Quote, cannot be taken from us by any human power, end quote. James Wilson, one of the six men who signed both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution after calling God, quote, the promulgator as well as the author of natural law, end quote, observed in his famous 1790 lectures on law, quote, I here close my examination into those natural rights which, in my humble opinion, it is the business of civil government to protect and not to subvert, and the exercise of which it is the duty of civil government to enlarge and not to restrain. I go farther and now proceed to show that in peculiar instances in which these rights can receive neither protection nor reparation from civil government, they are, notwithstanding its institution, entitled still to that defense and to those methods of recovery 
which are justified and demanded in a state of nature, end quote. To protect and enlarge our natural rights, this becomes the business of civil government, or at least one of the responsibilities or duties of government. Rights and the security thereof had gradually become a central focus of Englishmen as they wrestled with two oftentimes opposing concepts, the divine, example, God endorsed, right of kings on the one hand, and the unalienable, God-given rights of individuals on the other hand. Magna Carta became a waypoint in this investigation, forcing King John to subordinate his divine right and accept responsibility for protecting certain individual rights, including due process of law and trial by jury. Magna Carta was soon ignored, but was eventually replaced by newer versions. In the 17th century, Magna Carta's rights were supplemented by Parliament's Petition of Right, 1628, and the English Bill of Rights, 1689. This growing focus on natural rights accompanied America's settlers as they sailed for the colonies, being encapsulated in the first colonial charters as, quote, liberties, franchises, and immunities, end quote, of Englishmen. From there, rights were expanded and reinforced, expounded in a host of colonial documents beginning with the Mayflower Compact and ending 171 years later with the Constitution's Bill of Rights. Over this period, the colonists seldom passed up an opportunity to reiterate their essential rights. A partial list. 1620, the Mayflower Compact, Plymouth. 1636, Code of Law, Plymouth. 1639, Fundamental Orders, Connecticut. 1639, Acts for Liberties of the People, Maryland. 1641, Body of Liberties, Massachusetts. 1677, Declaration of the People, Virginia. 1701, Charter of Privileges, Pennsylvania. 1763, the rights of the British colonies asserted and proved, James Otis. 1764, the rights of colonies examined, Stephen Hopkins. 1765, Declaration of Rights and Grievances, Stamp Act Congress. 1766, an inquiry into the rights of the British colonies, Richard Bland. 1772, the Rights of the Colonist, Samuel Adams. 1774, A Summary View of the Rights of British America, Thomas Jefferson. 1774, Declaration and Resolves, First Continental Congress. 1775, Declaration on the Causes of Taking Up Arms, Second Congress. 1776, January, Bill of Rights, New Hampshire Convention. 1776, June, Declaration of Rights, Virginia. 1776, July, Declaration of Independence, Second Continental Congress. 1776, July, Declaration of Rights, Pennsylvania. 1776, September, Declaration of Rights, Delaware. 1780, Declaration of Rights, Massachusetts. 1788, Declaration of Rights, North Carolina. 1790, of the Natural Rights of Individuals, Lectures on Law, James Wilson. 1791, the U.S. Bill of Rights. Natural law and the natural rights which spring from them are enjoying a resurgence in popularity of late, thanks to the scholarly work of men like John Finnis, J. Bezizwiski, Hadley, Arkes, and others. As John Horvat explains, quote, 
The growing acceptance of natural law theory among frustrated Americans is shaking the legal field, end quote. This resurgence within the legal and scholarly communities appears to terrify some. However, natural law and natural rights are still ignored or misunderstood by the vast majority of Americans. There is no known inventory of natural rights, at least none that all political philosophers or natural rights expositors over the millennia have agreed upon. The founders knew, of course, of the Ten Commandments, which form the core of, quote, the laws of nature's God, end quote. If God commands, quote, thou shalt not steal, end quote, it seems reasonable to derive from that, quote, a right to acquire and retain property, end quote. Thou shalt not murder, end quote, denotes a, quote, right to the preservation of one's life, end quote. But no founding father appears to have attempted an enumeration of all natural rights. Indeed, as James Aradell explained at the 1788 North Carolina Ratifying Convention, such an enumeration, if used as the basis for a Bill of Rights, quote, would not only be useless but dangerous. It would be implying in the strongest manner that every right not included in the enumeration might be impaired by the government without usurpation. And it would be impossible to enumerate every one. Let anyone make what collection or enumeration of rights he pleases, I will immediately mention 20 or 30 more rights not contained in it." End quote. But a useful list of those essential rights the founders collectively supported can nevertheless be gleaned from their writings. As Chester James Antio explains, quote, the natural rights on which there was the largest agreement and the greatest significance were freedom of conscience and religion, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, property, the right to govern and tax themselves, and freedom of communication, end quote. Some founders also supported rights derived from the common law, such as the right to trial by jury, and freedom from warrantless searches. But such rights cannot be denominated as, quote, natural rights, since they would have no rational business in a hypothetical state of nature. The next question we must consider is how should the government fulfill its responsibility of protecting our unalienable rights? Is a Bill of Rights necessary or even appropriate? James Madison and other founders considered the Constitution itself to be a Bill of Rights, a Constitution of limited and enumerated powers carefully drawn will protect individual rights by not providing the new government with the power or authority necessary to infringe on those rights. Quote, for why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do, end quote, wrote Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 84. While the framers certainly felt that they had created a limited power document replete with checks and balances, History has shown the ambiguity of language to be the framers' downfall. The Anti-Federalist saw, quote, loopholes, end quote. For instance, the power given the Supreme Court would allow the court to, quote, mold the government into almost any shape they please, end quote. The Anti-Federalist fumed over the absence of a Bill of Rights, quote, would it have consumed too much paper, end quote, scowled Patrick Henry. <laughs> when sent a copy of the Constitution to review, Jefferson replied by gently chiding his friend, quote, a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inferences, end quote. And so a reluctant James Madison agreed to single-handedly champion the project. The initial draft he submitted to Congress, borrowing heavily from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, contained several protections which did not survive the House and Senate. Quote, wordsmithing, end quote. 
Madison's treasured, quote, rights of conscience, end quote, didn't even make it through the House Committee on which Madison himself sat. Despite these setbacks, Madison persisted, and the document was finally sent to the states for ratification, achieving that on 15th December, 1791, with Virginia's acceptance. But would a Bill of Rights be enough? In an October 1788 letter to Thomas Jefferson, Madison had warned that even a Bill of Rights might not be sufficient. Quote, Repeated violations of these parchment barriers have been committed by overbearing majorities in every state. In Virginia, I have seen the Bill of Rights violated in every instance where it has been opposed to a popular current, end quote. Quote, tyranny of the majority, end quote, the primary reason for the founders abhorred democracy. But infringements of rights do not require a majority. With the help of the government, even a minority can prevail. Americans have recently witnessed how a government can be enticed to infringe upon our unalienable rights by a, quote, popular current, end quote, arising from even a small minority faction. The revelation that officials in the executive branch of the federal government colluded with the media companies to silence the public expression of viewpoints they did not agree with shocks us. It is reminiscent of the communist regimes under Stalin and Mao, not to mention the authoritarian governments in present day Russia and China. Jefferson believed that, quote, the Republican is the only form of government which is not eternally at open or secret war with the rights of mankind, end quote. That, fortunately or unfortunately, is a question only the American people can answer. They are the ultimate sovereigns in any Republican form of government. Government is their servant, not the reverse. Unfortunately, the American people, by and large, have abandoned the Founders' view of both law and government. If there's any good news here, it is that at least some Americans, those who understand the societal sea change being forced upon them, are willing to fight for protection of their unalienable rights. Welcome assistance comes from the present Supreme Court, which is currently staffed with the majority of justices who share an originalist and therefore founder's view of rights. But our trust in a temporary majority of originalist justices should be cautioned by the realization that future courts may not be so favorably apportioned. As Jefferson reminds us, quote, In questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution, end quote. So it is to the Bill of Rights itself we must turn. Is its language sufficient or too open to interpretation? Should we consider the words of the original Bill of Rights as unamenable? Or should we be willing to clarify ambiguous 18th century language? Are we to accept our society's present worldview confusion as inevitable? Or should we work to correct it? These are the sort of questions we should be asking and debating. In his 1967 inaugural address, the great Ronald Reagan cautioned, quote, freedom is a fragile thing and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation for it comes only once to a people. And those in world history who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again." End quote. If we want to continue to enjoy our natural, unalienable, God-given rights, and we wish our posterity to be likewise blessed, we must be prepared to fight for and defend them. I will conclude with the words of Founder John Jay, first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court under the new Constitution, who in 1777, while instructing charging a New York grand jury reminded us, quote, every member of the state ought diligently to read and to study the constitution of his country 
and teach the rising generation to be free. By knowing their rights, they will sooner perceive when they are violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them." End quote. Note that, for at that time, Judge Jay, reading the Constitution is not sufficient. It should also be studied, and diligently so. The goal, of course, lies not simply in the reading and studying. The goal is to pass on what you have learned to the next generation of Americans. Even then, the project is not complete. The rising generation requires this knowledge to be better equipped to defend and assert their rights, thus hopefully perpetuating a society of freedom and liberty. John Jay would be proud of the commendable work Constituting America accomplishes in pursuing his charge. Gary Porter is Executive Director of the Constitution Leadership Initiative. We thank you for joining us for today's essay. This is our 13th annual 90-day study at Constituting America. I am Janine Turner, founder of Constituting America. I and Kathy Gillespie, Constituting America's CEO, welcome you to our 90-day study. This is our 13th annual study. And this one this year is about America's founding principles. Be sure to check out last year's study about American exceptionalism. Have a wonderful day and we'll meet you back here tomorrow.